Well, hello, brothers and sisters, and very warm greetings. My name is Christopher Sparks, and I'm the translator of the Keys of the Kingdom Holy Bible. And a very warm welcome to the Keys of the Kingdom Holy Bible YouTube channel, the channel that tells you everything about the Bible they do not want you to know. And the purpose of this channel is the campaign for translation truth, because if we restore the Word of God, we will restore the people of God. Amen. And blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now first, a very huge thank you to the patrons of this channel through Patreon and all subscribers and supporters and the wonderful comments that you make, which I think must act as some sort of wall of fire against mockers because we don't get much of that kind of trouble because I think they uh, would see their comments <laughs> against yours and it would make them look rather foolish. So please, God, keep away the mockers and time wasters, the trolls. Now, uh, second uh, bit of news. The publisher sent today to the printer the file for the next edition of Keys of the Kingdom Bible, which will be a leather-covered edition um, because the hardback is almost sold out. There are just a handful left, and I have a few. And the other bit of news is I had a box full of books today. Arrived my new book, Searching for Hell, or booklet rather, and which is available from the website. And I will no doubt be giving a few talks on this, God willing. And uh, in fact, it um, derived from some talks I gave last year, and it was suggested by the publisher I write a book on hell, and uh, so this exposes this great lie that the loving God and Creator tortures people in fire and examines all the passages very closely in context and meaning and brings out things that have not been brought out before. What are the meanings of these words? What are the contexts and the wider um, uh, scope of what's being said? So... As I say, that's now available from the website. Uh, please don't use Amazon. They have been horrible to me. Right, today's um, subject, the sparks of fire. Demythologizing Revelation chapter 9. Are the locusts demonic rock stars? Well, I'm sure you know <laughs> the answer to that. But why do I even put such a title? Well, let me tell you about, oh, where are we now, 19, uh, 2024. So I would say a good 30, 35 years ago, somebody lent me or perhaps gave me a cassette tape recording of a man giving a talk on um, secret satanic coding in rock music. And he had a reel-to-reel -reel tape recorder. And so he would play segments of various rock and pop songs and then put his reel-to-reel -reel tape player in reverse and you could hear these lyrics um, in reverse uh, saying kind of satanic um, uh, horrible things. Uh, the only trouble was that the tape kept jamming, the tape on the reel, or going very slowly or too fast. Now this, he informed us, <laughs> sorry, for my, I can't contain myself, this, he said, was demonic interference. And he was blabbing in some glossolalia to try and make these things depart. And then he said that uh, these rock stars, 20th century rock stars, <laughs> are in, in the book of Revelation. And so he started reading from chapter 9, describing the locusts and uh, hair like women. And... Uh, then that they have tails, and he said that these tails were the leads from their guitars going into the 
power box. <laughs> so that's one interpretation of Revelation chapter 9. Now, another interpretation that I have read in the last couple of years, I've read two commentaries on the book of Revelation, which uh, books were kindly given to me. Now, I must say there were some very useful things in these books. However, both of them said that these locusts and the king that they have over them were the Saracens, and the king over them is Muhammad. And so this is projecting forward seven centuries from the time that John was writing. Well, let's have a look and see, see how these theories hold up. I will give you another humorous um, reading of Revelation 9 at the end. But first, the serious one. So Revelation chapter 9 descri describes an angel having the key to the abyss, and he opens it, and out of the pit comes a furnace of uh, sorry, um, fire and smoke and, um, and locusts, and um, a great army of locusts. Well, the first thing we need to know is, what is this? key of the abyss and what is the abyss well in revelation chapter 20 we see a similar thing that uh, but this time the abyss is locked up and shut up and it shut over a uh, people so those from the abyss are the people who are the dragon the serpent the enemy the slanderer they're all one and the same the dragon and the serpent who is the enemy and the slanderer. They are not four different peoples or, pe or people or personalities. They are all one and the same because they're written in a list. They're also written in a list in Revelation chapter 12. They are all one and the same. And in Revelation 20, they are also the same as what it says in verse 8. There's people of synagogue and Magog. And so chapter 9 describes a star. And uh, so let's have a look at the exact wording. I can't remember it. Um, I saw a star fallen out of the sky onto the earth, and the key of the pit of the abyss was given to him. Well, now, a star, sometimes, yes, of course, such as in Revelation chapter 1, it is a light in the sky. But it is also a biblical figure of speech for a ruler, and fallen rulers. In Isaiah chapter 14, we have the description of the king of Babylon as a star fallen out of the sky, a disgraced ruler, a disgraced monarch. And in Judges 5.20, the wonderful song of the judge Deborah. I saw a wonderful painting of her in a, a book yesterday, which I took out of the library. Uh, Judges chapter 5, verse 20. The stars fought from the heavens. They fought from their courses against Sisera. So the stars fought from the heavens. The rulers fought among the political powers. They fought from their courses against Sisera. So they're human fighters. Not something mystical going on in the sky. This is mythology and nonsense. And in Matthew 24, Jesus talks about stars falling from the sky. Well, these are rulers again. These are not astronomical bodies that are going to drop onto the earth. They're fallen rulers. So this star in Revelation 9.1 is a ruler. And uh, he releases... Um, from the pit, um, fire and smoke and locusts. Well, this ruler of the abyss is ruler over, what is an abyss? An abysmal people. 
and abysmal people, the dregs, as in Revelation 20, verse 2, the worst sorts of people from the, from the abyss, the abysmal people. That's a way to remember it. So what am I driving at? I'm driving at this is all to do with people and nothing to do with um, real locusts. And now, Revelation chapter 1 verse 1 says that it's speaking of things which must shortly come to pass or come to pass or have to arise with speed or shortly. And that's repeated in chapter 22 verse 6. So that's entaki. And then there's another word, taku, um, quickly, which is used seven times about the coming of Jesus. I am coming quickly. And come soon, Lord Jesus. So we read that this people that have come out of the abyss, this dregs of humanity, this abysmal people, are physically attacking people because chapter 9 verse 4 says that they are given power to injure those who do not have the seal of God on their forehead. Well, those who have the seal of God are Christian men and women. So those who do not have the seal are non-Christian men and women, those who are not described as the virgins who have the seal of God on their forehead. And virgin, of course, means spiritually. It doesn't mean sexually. It's another metaphor, another biblical figure. And now the apostle and prophet John, close friend of Jesus, was with Jesus and the apostles in Jerusalem. He was there at the Last Supper. So do you not think the focus of his writing would all be about Jerusalem and Judah and the Israelites, the people of God, the 12 tribes of Israel? Well, I put it to you that the book of Revelation was written by John around about A.D. 50 because he was exiled into the island of Patmos by Nero Caesar. And Nero Caesar reigned or ruled from A.D. 41 to 54. So this story that Revelation was written in A.D. 96, I dismiss as so much rubbish, because it is recorded that by the 90, A.D. 90s, John was old and infirm. He would not have been vigorous enough for all this, and probably not vigorous enough to write it all. And furthermore, had he written in AD 96, I would have described, would not you, all that happened to Jerusalem throughout the AD 50s and 60s and then AD 70, and what happened afterwards. I'd be writing retrospectively. Now the Peshitta version says on the title page of Revelation, that um, John was exiled there by Nero Caesar. It must have been written before his um, Nero's rule came to an end in AD 54. Oh yes. Right, um, now chapter 9 verse 2 speaks of this fire and smoke and blazing furnace. Well, I would like to read to you from the Jewish historian Josephus, who wrote a book, The Jewish War. And my version here is a Penguin classic, and it's translated by G. A. Williamson, and uh, with a new introduction by E. Mary Smallwood. And when did she publish this? 1959. So this is the edition I'm reading from. And uh, so I'm going to read to you oh, a good half page here 
which I hope you will find illuminating and help our study of deciding whether or not the locusts in Revelation 9 are 7th century Saracens or 20th century rock stars or are they something else? In book 6 of uh, The Jewish War, uh, Josephus writes the following. Now, if you get hold of this edition, it's the same edition. It's on pages 370 and 371. Um, now, he writes, now this is going to be quite a chunk. Masters now of the walls, the Romans set up their standards on the towers, and with clapping and singing celebrated their victory, having found the end of the war much easier than the beginning. They had surmounted the last wall without losing a man. It seemed too good to be true. And when they found no one to oppose them, they could make nothing of it. They poured into the streets, sword in hand, cut down without mercy all who came within reach, and burnt the house of any who took refuge in doors, occupants and all. Many they raided, and as they entered in search of plunder, they found whole families dead, and the rooms full of the victims of starvation. Horrified by the sight, they emerged empty-handed. Pity for those who had died in this way was matched by no such feeling for the living. They ran every man through whom they met and blocked the narrow streets with corpses, deluging the whole city with gore, so that many of the fires were quenched by the blood of the slain. At dusk the slaughter ceased, but in the night the fire gained the mastery. And on the eighth of Gorpaios, the sun rose over Jerusalem in flames, a city that during the siege had suffered such disasters that if she had enjoyed as many blessings from her foundations, she would have been the envy of the world. And a city that deserved these terrible misfortunes on no other account than that she produced a generation such as brought about her ruin. When Titus ended, he was astounded by the strength of the city, and especially by the towers which the party chiefs in their mad folly had abandoned. Observing how solid they were all the way up, how huge each block of stone, and how accurately fitted, how great their breadth and how immense their height, he exclaimed aloud, this is Titus, remember, God has been on our side. It is God who brought the Jews down from this strongholds, these strongholds, for what could human hands or instruments do against such towers? At that time he made many such remarks to his friends. Um, paragraph later, all the prisoners taken from beginning to end of the war totaled 97,000. Those who perished in the long siege 1,100,000. Right, do, do you think I might be a little misguided in saying that Revelation chapter 9 is all about Jerusalem and Titus and the Roman army? It says only those were injured who did not have the seal of God. Well, Jesus said, when you see Jerusalem surrounded by military, a military camp, flee into the mountains. And he said, these are the days of vengeance. And in Mark 13 describes this, this is a, um, what's the exact wording, these days will be a tribulation. Well, John 1 uh, sorry, Revelation 1, John says, I'm your companion, fellow companion in the tribulation. This is what it's all about. And so you can read about this in Luke 21 and Matthew 24, Mark 13, Luke 17. Um, Jesus is constantly telling his people that when you see these things, get out, 
flee to the mountains, flee to the country areas. And if you're, he said, if you're out in the country regions, do not go into her. That's what Jesus said. So if you're in, get out. If you're out, stay out. Right. Um, it reminds me of... Um, Oh, Fireman Sam, my children used to used to watch, and there was a, a Welsh uh, Welsh accent. One of the fire fire brigade um, said, "If you if there's a fire in your house, get out, stay out, and get the fire brigade out." So in Jerusalem, if you're in, get out; if you're out, stay out. And Revelation eighteen verse four. Come out of her, my people. Oh yes, it all links up, doesn't it? And woe to those who stay. And Jesus says in Reve or Revelation 18, her sins have piled up to heaven. This is not about the Saracens or 20th century rock stars. So those who had the seal of God did get out. And uh, they were led out into a wilderness, Revelation 12, 14 says, where they were nourished away from the, the face of the serpent. And did John the Baptist, the, um, the messenger ahead of the Messiah, call his enemies serpents and brood of vipers? And Jesus said the same things. And so this serpent, we know who they are. And at the end of Revelation 9, it talks about idolatry and sorcery and murders. Well, these are the covenant breakers of the Israelites. And the prophet Ezekiel, particularly in chapter 23 of Ezekiel, describes Jerusalem and Judah's and Israel's whoredoms and adulteries and fornications. And here in Revelation chapter 9, they did not unburden themselves of their fornications and murders and idolatries. And they killed John and Jesus. So, verse 11 of chapter 9, they had a king over them who was a destroyer. Well, if it's the... Um, Saracens, uh, well, who was their king, who was a destroyer, well, it just doesn't all fit. And if it's 20th century rock stars, who's the king? Well, of course, there was one called the king, but I don't think he was, I don't think he was there. So Jerusalem and the, her Herodian uh, priesthood employed by King Herod. Now, the Herod kings were puppet kings um, appointed by the Romans. So Herod the Great was first. And then they, um, Herod the Great was the infant killer, the massacre of the infants under two years old. And then there was Herod Antipas and Herod Agrippa II. And these killed the infants and John and Jesus and the apostle Jacob in Acts chapter 12. So they were a guilty and venomous, um, villainous race. Matthew 23, Jesus said their guilt went right back to that of the blood of righteous Abel. So they were related back to the Canaanites and this was through the um, Edom, who was Esau, and the Herod line were Edomites. And now after Jesus died, and the curtain of the temple was immediately torn from top to bottom, the once and final sacrifice, the pure and spotless Lamb of God, they continued in the temple making sacrifices and selling animals and birds for sacrifices and conducting international trading as shown in Revelation chapter 18. 
so they did not unburden themselves of all these things. So now, <laughs> oh yes, who are the locusts? Well, they killed those without the seal of God, so they were killing people. They had crowns, hair like women's, faces like men, or faces of men, teeth like lions, breastplates of iron, wings, tails, stings like scorpions, and power to hurt and kill. Do you know there's something in those described in Revelation chapter 9 verses 7 to 11 that rather reminds me of Ephesians chapter 6 and the armour. Armour of what? Oh yes, the Roman army. Well, I have a picture here. Now, let's go through that list again. Had crowns. Oh yes, helmets. Hairs like women. Oh yes, great plumes on their helmets. Breastplates of iron. Oh yes, breastplates. Wings. Well, look at the winged jet decoration to make them look fearsome. Tails. Oh yes, the scabbard for their swords. And stings like scorpions. Oh, look at that sharp sword. And power to hurt and kill. And of course the, um, the shields. Wing-like effects. Did I hold that up straight for you to see? I hope I did because I can't see through this paper. The locusts are the Roman army. <laughs> and, uh, they are not, these locusts, they are not interferers with tape recorders. They are not rock stars. And the smoke and fire and idolatry and crowns and plumes and breastplates of iron, they are not 7th century Saracens and the king over them was not Muhammad. But uh, maybe it's another theory. Maybe it was me causing the smoke and fire because it says in Job chapter 41 verse 19 out of his mouth go burning torches sparks of fire fly out out of his nostrils come smoke as if out of a pot boiling over burning rushes his breath burns coals and a flame goes out from his mouth oh yes perhaps <laughs> perhaps it's me in revelation 9 well that is no more bonkers than saying it was 20th century rock stars or 7th century Saracens. Now, <laughs> Revelation is not an easy read. To, um, the, the various um, the, the chapters, the, the trumpets, etc., they are not it's not all written in chronological order. The um, passages, the events overlap like in a sort of Fibonacci pattern. And uh, some things project forward. And then another chapter um, winds it back a, a little. So we have to spend years studying this to understand it. Um, but I'd like to give you four keys to understanding or making sense of what we can of this apocalyptic vision, which I say is all about the destruction of Jerusalem right up to the end of chapter 19. First of all, before or during reading Revelation, it will be very helpful to look at Jesus' prophecies concerning Revelation in Matthew 24, Mark 13, Luke 17, and Luke 21. 
And Jesus said that that generation would not pass until these things had happened, which links with these things which must ar arise with speed or shortly. So that's the first thing, linking it back with other things Jesus said. Uh, second, to appreciate this um, clue in chapter 1 verse 1 that these things must arise with, arise with speed or shortly. So it's not projecting it into the 7th century or the 20th century and nothing happened in between. So if we believe that code, that decoding clue, we will be in a much better position and will not make silly um, interpretations that it's about 20th century rock stars or some such nonsense or demons interfering with tape recorders. And third, chapter one tells us that these things are written in signifiers and symbols. So um, let's just turn to that. Revelation chapter 1, verse 1. It says, He signified by sending through the agency of his angel. Um, so things which have to come to pass with speed, and he signified by sending. So signified, that this is in signs and symbols, signifiers. And then chapter 1 ends talking about the secret symbol, or if you like, the mystery of the seven stars that you saw in my right hand in the seven golden lampstands. So it tells us that this is a secret symbol or a mystery, something which has to be decoded. And then it tells, tells us exactly what they are. The seven stars signify messengers of the seven ecclesia groups, and the seven lampstands signif signify seven ecclesia groups. So there it gives you the decoding clue and an example. Just like a teacher with a, perhaps a mathematical formula gives you the formula, then gives you an example. So John, at the end of um, what we have marked as chapter 1, of course it wasn't divided for him then, that gives you an example. Right, and fourth, of course, is the beautiful internal harmony of the Word of God. Now, I have said before that my translating targets of accuracy, clarity, and literariness are pursued by my translating laws of grammar, internal harmony, logic, research, and text. So that second one, internal harmony. So it might be explained elsewhere. You cannot just flip it open at Revelation 9 and make it say something you want it to say and fit it into some crazy scheme. So there are four decoding clues. Look at what Jesus said. Believe what John said. These things must arise shortly that they're written in signifiers and symbols which have to be interpreted, so the locusts are not literal, the abyss is not literal, they are abysmal people, the locusts represent the Roman army, and fourth, the beautiful internal harmony of the word of God, and clues lie elsewhere, and so Revelation is the last book, and so you know, we do not read a novel um, by reading the last chapter first, so we have to have a good knowledge of everything that has proceeded. And so we know from the patriarchs onwards that the Bible, or the Word of God, the Scriptures, we should say really, are all about the twelve tribes of Israel and Judah and its capital Jerusalem and the northern kingdom, its capital Samaria. That is the subject, and it doesn't stray outside that. So praise God for all these um, wonderful clues he's given us and these deep writings and the wider scope 
and the length of the scriptures because we'll be studying it for the whole of our lives and I'll be on my campaign for translation truth to, until either the day comes that I'm transformed and receive my resurrection body and I pray and hope that that is what will happen or alternatively until I die and am raised and receive my resurrection body I will be working tirelessly on this campaign for translation truth and I know you also will be working tirelessly to serve the living God and to understand his beautiful word and if we're not reading his word regularly it's because we don't love him enough you know I said to a friend yesterday we were talking about this and I said if a young man got letters every day from a woman he was obsessed with he'd be pouring over them all day and all night and similarly um, with a woman she received letters from some man she was obsessed with she'd be pouring over them and so we have a loving God he really loves us and the Lord Jesus Christ loves us and so we read all that they have to tell us with joy and delight Right, I hope you have enjoyed this demythologizing of Revelation chapter 9 and it gives you patterns for demythologizing other crazy stories that have followed the beautiful word of God. So, as ever, I always say, God bless you richly.